afternoon and welcome to Pathways for Parents. I'm Cindy Milner. Today we are going to have a discussion about the emotional development of young children with the backdrop of the movie Inside Out. My guests today are Kathy Moss. Hi, Kathy. Hello. And Alice Barber. Hi. They are both from Behavioral Health Network. Can you tell us what you do at Behavioral Health Network? Sure. Um, so I am a team leader there at um, BHN, and I also oversee the Early Childhood Mental Health Consultation Grant, which we send clinicians in to help young children in preschools with their behavior and their emotions. Great. And Kathy? I'm the Director of Healthcare and Community Integration. It's a mouthful, but my job is to find ways that our skill set of um, therapists working around social emotional development can help people in the community, teachers, school teachers, preschool teachers, housing workers, parents. That's great. What a great resource. And I've known you both for quite a long time, so I'm very comfortable kind of just, you know, working through this conversation, and I know you have the best answers. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we started this discussion when the movie Inside Out came out. And here's a book about Inside Out. Um, here are the characters, and if you ask anybody under the age of 10, they'd know them much quicker than any adult, but hopefully the adults have seen it. This is joy. This is anger. This is disgust, which is not a word I've often heard used with young children, but, but it's gotten its notoriety. Uh, here is fear, and this is sadness. Oh, sadness, one of my mm -hmm. favorites. <laughs> um, and when we talk about the development of young children, what would you say is the leading way that they learn emotion? Um, I think they learn emotion through experiencing emotions. Mm -hmm. um, so we are all born with the capacity for all of those inside of us. Yep. And um, as we know, young kids experience very strong emotions and often don't know what to do with them, but they're all in there. And so it's really how they learn how to manage them, and that is through watching us mm -hmm. um, and us helping them be able to identify their emotions and understand what to do with their bodies and their brains when they're feeling strong emotions. Yeah, yeah. Give me an example of that. I mean, I know when I um, talk with parents, I say, the one that I use is, you're in the middle of the grocery store and the child mm -hmm. throws themselves to the ground, you know, crying hysterically. What do you do? What do you do with that? And how do you explain that emotion to this child who really doesn't want to hear it? All they want is the box of candy or cookies that they saw on the shelf. Mm -hmm. How would you explain that to a child? I think oftentimes it depends on the child mm -hmm. and whether this has happened again and again and again and you're on your 30th time of them falling to the floor or whether this is their first time. Um, I think parents, so I'm a parent of a five-year-old <laughs> and um, so I, this has occurred in my life recently. And I think what's one of the things that's really hard about being a parent is that you want to be able to get through the grocery store without this happening and you don't want people looking at you and judging you as a parent and you don't want your child upset and you want to protect them from their emotions and um, sometimes in these situations you have to ride it out and that can be a really uncomfortable place for a parent to be right. um, and either ride it out there or ride it out in the car outside or because in the moment it's going to be really difficult to change that child's mind yep. that they want the candy and can't have it mm -hmm. um, and so they're going to be upset about it and to validate that that it is upsetting to them and you get why they're angry and that these are their options the hard part is is when a child is in that state they're in a part of the brain, just as in Inside Out, they're in a part of the brain where it's hard to, to discuss rationally with them about why they can't have the candy before dinner or the fact that you've bought 10 pieces of candy for them the week before, right. and so we have to slow down. Um, so sometimes when a, ch when a child is experiencing really strong emotions, you have to write it out before you have the conversation about mm -hmm. what happened. Um, and why it wasn't okay. What I often say, if I could jump in, what I often say to, to parents is a calm brain is a thinking brain mm -hmm. and that your child has to calm down before you can have those kind of conversations. That's true. 
And if this is something that's happened before, after the first time it happens, which you may be caught by surprise, in the future it's good to have conversation about next time we go to the grocery store, let's talk about what's going to happen and how you might feel when we get there and what happens if, and then what are we going to do about it, so that when you're actually in that situation, you already have a plan right. and you just enact it. Right. And then processing that with the child happens after they've calmed down. Right. The other thing that I was going to say is that um, we, we have emotions as well. We do. <laughs> and I think that's what makes this so difficult is that it's not just about the child and their emotions and helping them manage their emotions. Mm -hmm. We have emotional reactions as well. Right. Like Alice mentioned that we may get embarrassed, we are embarrassed. or upset mm -hmm. or angry mm -hmm. if this mm -hmm. is happening in the grocery store. And you have to be supporting your child's emotional response and teaching at the same time you're trying to manage your own. Absolutely. So give yourself some think time, right? So take a deep breath, figure out where you're at, uh, and, and, and give yourself some think time. Because sometimes we're like, okay, I gotta get out of here, let's go. Mm -hmm. And you realize that the meltdown is gonna continue. Mm -hmm. So you give yourself some think time, plan your words ahead, like mm -hmm. you said, Kathy, plan what you're gonna say. Mm -hmm. if, if this happens, then this is what's gonna, what I'm gonna do mm -hmm. about it. I'm gonna mm -hmm. pick you up, we're gonna leave, if you can do that, mm -hmm. if not, have a plan. Well, and I think Kathy brings up a good point is a lot of times with young kids, we assume that they have the skills innately to manage these emotions. Mm -hmm. And some kids have some skill um, for whatever reason, and other kids, they don't know what to do with themselves. Right. So they don't know what to do with their these really strong emotions that are flooding their brains and their bodies. And you're in the grocery store and they, they don't know, they don't know what to do. Right. And so to practice ahead of time, like this is what we're going to do when we pass the candy aisle. Right. Yeah. And I think starting early, right? Mm -hmm. Starting really from that toddler, from that, you know, from that infant to that toddler and say, yes. I can see you're angry. And how can I tell that? By talking about what, what we see as adults. I see that your face is red. I see that your, mm -hmm. you know, your eyes are, are, have an angry look to them or your fists are tight or you're frustrated giving them those words. When should we start giving them the words? I think as soon as possible. I think as soon as you start giving words for other things mm -hmm. to a child. Um, so we start really early saying, this book is red. Can you say red? Right. <laughs> um, or this is the number one. Can you say number one? Yeah. And we're very focused as a culture on teaching these sort of academic cognitive skills right. um, from a very early age. And so kids go to preschool and they are expected to learn the alphabet forwards and backwards and learn how to start to spell their yeah. names and, and all of these things, which are all really, really important. Um, but often what's left out of that is uh, the naming of emotions. Right, the emotional yep. development, mm -hmm. yeah. Anything else, Kathy? Yes. <laughs> I was going to say that it takes a long time. And it I think does. that's another challenge in our fast-paced culture yeah. is because it's not something that you can just be and do and be done, that you have to devote the time with your child to sit, to wait out the emotional reactions, to talk with them about what's going on for them, to give them the language, and expect to have it happen over and over and over again as they start to internalize and build those skills. It doesn't happen overnight. It and does. busy working parents, um, kids with lots of activities, mm -hmm. you really have to devote the time, mm -hmm. the downtime, yep. to work through those things together. And, and you have to know temperament, right? Mm -hmm. So the chi every child, every adult has a temperament, whether we are you know, innately gregarious and happy or whether we're just kind of sullen and reserved. We have to look at temperament and then from that temperament, really decide what that child you know, is going to use the most and how are they going to build on those skills that they already have. Mm -hmm. um, so we're using those words early is important. We, like you said, we teach lots of things lots before of things. they're two, yep. um, but we should really start concentrating on the emotional. Words. Well, and I also think that in early childhood, developmental stages come so quickly. Mm -hmm. So the difference between a 31-year-old and a 32-year-old is not necessarily that great. But the difference between a 3-year-old or a 2-year-old and a 5-year-old is huge. And so their capacity keeps changing and growing the older they get. Mm -hmm. And so you can revisit the same lessons over and over and over again and get perhaps different responses from children 
based on the fact that their brain is growing so fast and they're taking in so much information right. um, that, that it, it is something that you have to keep revisiting with them again and again and again. And not only in words, but I think also in experiential things. Like, you know, you, you um, were playing nicely with Johnny and mm -hmm. then Johnny took something that you had. Mm -hmm. Really, that experience and revisiting what happened and putting words to, to both sides of that emotion mm -hmm. is a bigger teaching moment than just using the big red lips mm -hmm. to say, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, I think that experiential stuff. So whenever we see something we should talk about either in the moment or maybe a special time at the end of the day or the beginning of the day to mm -hmm. preempt anything that might happen. I like how you're describing it as descriptive. You're talking about it as, as describing what you're observing. Because yep. oftentimes parents, especially in our culture of praise, when I say, oh, good job, great job, good job, great job, that's not very specific. Children can't learn from that. It but doesn't say, say anything. Exactly. But yep. to say, I noticed that right. you were in the sandbox and this happened and then you did this really gives the child very more concrete uh, examples of what, what they're learning, what you're trying to teach them. Exactly. Well, I also think, um, <laughs> That, you know, I've been, I've been asked to do some things with my son sometimes from some of his providers, and I get to the end of the day, and it's been <laughs> so busy, and I realize I haven't done right. any of them. So even making, making a, a decision to be able to identify something that your child has done once a day or once every other day, even starting there, because you get to the end of the day, and it's been so fast-paced, and you think... I haven't identified an emotion, you know, mm -hmm. and not to beat yourself up over that, um, but but I think um, to just start to give the child some words for what they're experiencing when you can. Yeah, absolutely. This movie, um, I think we talked about a couple minutes ago, taught in an hour what you've been teaching for yes. 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> So yes. the kids came away from the movie having the language, like, uh -huh. I feel joy today, and I mm -hmm. feel angry, and I feel sad, and, and so that's wonderful. I think Pixar did a great job yes. in, in developing the, the yep. characters. Yep. What else can parents do to kind of bring these skills in, use this as a backdrop, but then what else? What else should be, you think? Um, modeling what they're doing, what they're feeling, right. and what they're doing with their own emotions, yeah. I think is huge. And uh, if kids learn that by parents that hitting is okay, that yelling is okay, they're gonna do the things that have come out of my child's mouth that I have said, I, I, I didn't even think he was listening. Yeah. And he's taking in absolutely every single right. thing that I say. And so if I say something about anger, He's taking that in, and it's going around in his brain, and he's internalizing it. And so to be able to, for us as adults to identify our own emotions, which isn't as easy as it sounds, um, because I do see some adults in my practice as well, and they can't necessarily identify their own emotions. So this is not a necessarily an easy thing that we're all well practiced at. And, um, and yet we expect it of our kids. Mm -hmm. um, and so to really work on our own understanding of what we're feeling, when we're feeling it, and what our bodies feel like, what our brains feel right. like, can we think, can we not think, and then translating that to our children. Yeah, absolutely. I tell parents often, you know, or t when I talk to kids, like, how are you feeling at the moment? You know, are your fingers tight and squished up? Are you mm -hmm. feeling hot? Are you mm -hmm. feeling making them aware of their body. Mm -hmm. So looking in the mirror and looking at our own temperament and looking at our own methods of coping with emotion mm -hmm. is huge because, well, a lot of times too, we go over the edge when we're exhausted. Mm -hmm. We go over the edge when there's too much to do, when there's time limits and there's, you know, kids pushing our buttons and whatnot. So really taking a look at ourselves right. and what we do. Right. I'm leaving the room right now for five minutes because yep. I'm feeling angry or I'm feeling sad or however, overwhelmed. So well, and I also sense. think that, that we tend as parents to do a couple of things and, and we want desperately to protect our kids, mm -hmm. desperately. And that's for most of us a very innate feeling and to rush to their aid um, with, any, with any strong emotion that we see them feeling with the exception of joy 
Um, we want them to be joyful and be joyful all the time, uh, right, but that's right. not but that's not realistic. And so, you know, when when my son is feeling angry or um, when he's feeling scared, I, my instinct is to jump right in there and help prevent those feelings. Right. Um, and on the flip side of that, also, if I'm angry or sad or scared about something, to hide that from my son. So there's a lot of you, sort of... You do hide that from your son? Um, I, I, I don't want to... I, like yep. my clinical brain, my therapist brain <laughs> says, um, Alice, you don't need to do this. Right. But I also don't want to worry him. Yep. And so my instinct is often okay, what do I have to do in this moment not to worry him? And I think it's a balance. Right. I think it's definitely maybe. a balance. It's tempering. Um, but I've worked with a lot of parents who, uh, you know, somebody has died in the family and they, they, they keep the child over here and pretend not to be grieving in the face of the child in order to protect the child. And I don't think that that is always protective of the child, that, mm -hmm. that it is not allowing the child to experience A, their own life, and B, their own set of emotions that were so eloquently described in this movie. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so we do a lot of stopping, I think, as parents. Um, of our children's emotions and our own emotions, thinking that we're protecting them, when really we're just sort of stuffing the emotions back down. Right. And they're there, um, and we need to talk about them and describe them and understand the process by which we get through them. And that was, that was, I'm sorry, that was very clear in the movie. Yes. Because Joy tried really hard to make mm -hmm. sure everybody else stayed in their circle, yes. right? Yes. Tried a circle for sadness, and she had to stay there and realized in the end that it was the balance of those emotions and managing those emotions that was the success, right? as opposed to always being joyful. Exactly. Parents always come to me. One of the, one of the biggest things parents come to me with, besides behavior, like my child is hitting, kicking, spitting, or whatever, is there's this truth in our family, and I don't want to tell my child because I don't want to upset them or I don't want to expose them to the news, and I don't want to expose them to whatever because I don't want them to be scared or upset. And again, I think there's a balance there. Mm -hmm. And by keeping children away from strong emotions, we're doing a disservice right. to them. You're right. And, and I think because of the fact that, you know, when that emotion comes out and you are there, you're there to support them through mm -hmm. it and guide them through it. If we, like you say, kind of stuff it down and mm -hmm. it didn't happen, it's not going to happen, they then have to work through that all over again. Yep. Whether it be at school when there's nobody really there to help them or in another situation. So I think having, having them have the emotion and caring adults being there to help them through that emotion is really which is a really key. hard thing to do. It is. So I don't want to, you know, yeah. I don't want to minimize that how hard that is to do mm -hmm. because when my son is scared, I get, I feel scared, you know, and right. and it's a really um, to be able to look at your child and say that he he or she is a separate person from myself, and they're having their own experiences, and I need to be there to support and allow them to have their own experiences. That's really challenging. It is. It is. I was just going to say that temperament is really important. To I want to bring it back to what you said earlier about that because. Parents and kids don't always have the same temperament. Exactly. <laughs> and so recognizing it's really about meeting your child where they're at in many ways. And for a lot of reasons, you want them to be here, but you want them to just get over it. You want them to fix it because it's uncomfortable for mm -hmm. you or you're in a hurry or you're late for a meeting or you're, you're rushing somewhere. And so it's, part of it is, is, is realizing that it takes time and that you have to sit with discomfort yourself. But also, back to temperament, that your temperament and their temperament may not necessarily be all that compatible right. and recognizing who they are um, and being able to tolerate that and support them. And that's hard. It's that's very really hard. hard as a parent <laughs> to have a different temperament than your child. Mm -hmm. you know? in, in the movie, they um, really looked at the four, five, 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 five basic uh, emotions. Mm -hmm. But there are many more that we mm -hmm. should use the language. Um, and I asked parents, what's the most difficult emotion to work with with your child. Any thoughts on that? What they would have said? Mm -hmm. uh, which, my what's guess, your most difficult? My guess would be anger. Is My guess about what they said would yep. be anger. Right. Did, is that what they said? No. No? <laughs> really? Sadness? Fear. 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 Oh, huh? angst. 
That is so interesting. There yep. is an absolute epidemic in our culture right now of young children with anxiety disorders. Mm -hmm. The diagnosis of anxiety disorder is higher than it's been, exponentially higher than it's been right. in the past. Yep. And it is, a hard, it is hard mm -hmm. to, to work through fear, mm -hmm. um, to help a child, you know. And it's easy for us to say, oh, don't worry about that. Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. We went through that once before. Right. right. <laughs> Kathy and I were uh, working together when the tornado came through and then the yeah. microburst came through. That right. won't happen again. Right. And right. then, you know, right. but we had to work with the children and talk with them about mm -hmm. their fear. Uh, and, and fear is a hard one to change. There's some great resources out there. There was a, um, a speaker in one of the local districts um, this week actually oh. talking about, I think it was anxious parents, anxious children, and how to stop the worry cycle. And it was a fascinating talk, but that focus was on saying it's okay, you'll be fine, isn't helpful isn't actually. Helpful. It's counter counterintuitive, but really what's helpful is to say fear is normal. And what we need to look at is whether this is a situation that should trigger that fear or mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. And the message is that you're capable. Right. Um, and how do we remind you that you're capable? What skills and tools do I give you to get through this difficult and scary situation? So it's really about patient listening mm -hmm. to your child about fear, whether it's fear or mm -hmm. anger or sadness, mm -hmm. really that patient listening. Mm -hmm. And then taking that listening and rephrase it, sending mm -hmm. it back to your child, telling them what you've understood, and then helping them problem solve. Is that right? Yeah, and I think, I think um, another thing that I hear parents doing out of, out of desperately wanting to help their child is offering a host of suggestions. You can do this, 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 and this. And really in my practice, what I've seen is the most brilliant interventions have come from the children themselves. Mm -hmm. And so to, to know that as a parent, you're not actually doing this alone, that you are doing it in conjunction with the child. And the child, you, you may say to the child, you know, I understand why you're feeling scared. I get that. This is really normal. What do you think we should do next? Or how can I be helpful right. to you? And what they come up with is, has been far superior to, to things that I have gone to school to learn right. and you know what I think might be helpful to them maybe is something that's been helpful to me. Mm -hmm. um, I also say to parents, if you're in this situation, how would you like to be responded to? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to say to you when you are really, really angry, do you want me to say to you, oh, it's, it's that's fine, nothing. <laughs> that's nothing. And, and when we put ourselves back in our emotional feeling place and think about how we want to be responded to, children are, are similar beings. Yes. Um, and so we don't want to be invalidated. They don't want to be invalidated. They want to be heard. We want to be heard. And we empower them when we let mm -hmm. them solve their own problems and solve their mm -hmm. own fears. It's empowering. Some of the good um, words that were, when we were doing this earlier, uh, we, we used these words, but then there were some other words that we can use with kids to let them know how they're feeling and what they're doing. And I thought these were great because they empower, they help children and adults think about different ways of managing problems. So here are some of the uh, ideas. Brave, you're brave, mm -hmm. cheerful. I can see you're worried, you're mm -hmm. frightened. Mm -hmm. I like the way you were calm today, right? Mm -hmm. So these are ways of both embracing and encouraging new behavior and new language. Mm -hmm. um, I see you're confused. That's, that's, to me, that's a good one because you can see that they're struggling with two sides of a, of a, of a question. You're curious, you're frustrated. Um, you know what I just jump in is I yes. love what you were saying earlier is that actually then defining those for mm -hmm. very young children. Right. I see that you're curious and here's how I know that. Yes. I see you're curious because you're asking lots of questions. I see you're frightened because um, you're, you have a surprised look on your face because right. your hands are clenched because you're because then you're giving them not only the words but how they can then pair the words in the future with their own experience. Their own experience and the cues. Right. Yeah. So these are great. Um, I can see you're bored, mm -hmm. right? And these are words that we should be using because instead of saying knock it off, mm -hmm. you know, sit down and relax, we should mm -hmm. be giving them the words that we see them and in building their power for understanding emotion. I have a comment about the word bored, yes. which is that it is definitely experience of in and of itself, 
but it is also very often a code word that kids use um, to mean something else. I'm bored means I'm scared, I feel depressed, I don't understand. Very often in school, kids check out and say I'm bored because they don't understand what's going on. Good point. And so when a kid uses the word bored, it's always a little red flag for me to say, is that is that truly boredom? Yep. And why? Right. Is it because they're they're left out, they don't understand, they've been left behind, they're scared, they're depressed? Yeah, good points. I think to also have visuals to go along with this. Mm -hmm. So so your brain learns in lots of different ways, and one of them is visually. And um, so to have, so in my office I have a big poster and it has the names of the emotions, but it also has a face attached to that. Yeah. And kids will, and you can print them off Google. Um, you can just go in and say emotions poster, emotions, uh, emotions board, and have it in your house. And children will, young children will go to it. Mm -hmm. And they go to it in my office. I don't prompt them to go to it, but they go to it and say, what's this one again? And I think I'm feeling this way. And having that visual, it, it just, it goes to a different part of the brain and it helps them learn even more thoroughly Absolutely. what the emotions are. And then the parent can jump onto that and say, mm -hmm. in what situations do you feel that way? Right. And when you feel that way, how do you generally handle that? Yeah. What do you do next when you feel that way? Yeah, exactly. And that's what books are good for. Great. Mm -hmm. So, you know, reading books and looking at, like this one, I, I, I work with very young children. So here's one about, uh, what's that noise, little mouse, right? Things that are um, frightening. And I love it because <laughs> it has noise. And kids that are startled when they go to bed or kids that are startled by lightning or kids that are startled by, you know, mm -hmm. loud noises, um, it really, let's see. Mm -hmm. um, I love the noises. And then it gives us time to, like, process it, to talk about it. And, and to really bring the pictures to life. So pictures are great. Whether you're going through a book or a magazine, mm -hmm. having them identify the, the faces, that whole empathy piece. Mm -hmm. Do I understand how I'm feeling? But do I understand how others are feeling? Um, here's a book about divorce, another strong emotion in a family. Mm -hmm. It's kind of it, great jumping. So books are great. There's books on fear. There's books on, here's a, here's a fearful one. Authors lose tooth for a child that's going to lose a tooth. That, that creates a lot of anxiety mm -hmm. and some fear. Mm -hmm. It's a good way to talk about it while it's happening, before it happens, or even after it happens. Um, I have a book, which I'll put up on our website, the Pathways for Parents website, that talks about books for young children's feelings. And it covers anger, anxiety, um, but I want it. <laughs> um, you know, The Penguin Who Lost Her Cool When I'm Angry. These are great books that parents can read to children and get a little bit out for themselves to have the words to share with their children. Anything else that you would use? I love the poster um, piece, too. Yeah, I think also for parents understanding what, what emotions look like in, in relatively typical development. So there's a period mm -hmm. of time in which it's very normal for a child to be scared of the dark right. or to think there are monsters under their bed. Right. And um, oftentimes the questions I get from parents are, is this what's typical or is this beyond? Um, so people always say you don't have a child, and a handbook, you know, a handbook does not come with it. Right. And so, <laughs> so you don't necessarily know that at a certain age this fear is very normal. Right. And um, you may start to worry as a parent, like when does it when does it cross that line? Right. And so for me, it's it's always about. Are the fear, is, is the fear, is the anger, is the sadness, whatever, whatever the emotion is, is it getting in the way of other things for that child? So is it getting in the way of their learning? Yes. So if a child is too anxious, they can't learn. Um, that d the part of their brain that is doing the learning has to sort of shut down and the, the, a different part takes over. Um, um, if... Um, you know, so, so knowing the typical development will help you understand sort of, sort of where a kid is and if, if it's impacting them cognitively, social, emotionally, or 
um, behaviorally, then that's when to intervene. Right. And, and you make a good point because, you know, sometimes kids um, get stuck. Mm -hmm. They get stuck on an emotion. And when, when you have a typically easygoing child and they seem to get stuck on an emotion, mm -hmm. that's when you would start to kind of question what's going on and then what do they do about it? Yeah, I think stuck in a way that's keeping them from learning, from socializing, right? from sleeping, yep. from eating, from toileting, from the things that you would expect a child to be doing rather naturally. Mm -hmm. And, um, and if they're sad all the time, th there should be a balance of emotions right. in a kid. Right. Um, how do we build resilience? How do we build resilience in a kid? I Step. think, I think ex well, f the foundation of resilience, I think, is a, is a loving relationship and being in community and knowing that, that you're not alone. Mm -hmm. And so that whether the parent, caregiver, teacher, uh, mentor relationship that gives that child a sense that I have value and I have worth is a really critical foundation for resilience. Right. And I think feelings and experiences of success. Mm -hmm. So when we were talking earlier about if the parents are always fixing it for them right. or giving them the answers, well, how about this or how about this or how mm -hmm. about this, doesn't give the child the experience that I'm capable. I'm capable. And so when I think they have experiences of being capable, they realize that they can um, be resilient in the face of adversity. They can face difficult situations and find a way. Mm -hmm. And I was going to say, thinking that when you were talking earlier too, is that kids have difficult times. They may get stuck in something. And I think an important message for parents to give is, this is hard, yes. but we can do this. Yeah. You can do this. We may need to get a therapist involved. We may need to get other resources, get some books, have some special other interventions. But there's no reason why we can't conquer this right. experience. And, and it's normal to get upset. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I know you have something that really is a pet peeve of yours. <laughs> so I've heard a lot in our culture people say, um, you get what you get and you don't get upset. And my kids came home from preschool saying that um, when they were very young and they say, you get, they say it to each other, you get what you get and you don't get upset. And I always always say, stop, you get what you, you may get what you get and you may absolutely be upset. Right. And what's important is you figure out what do you do with those feelings. Right. You get what you get, and you might get upset. Now what do you do about it? <laughs> right. Very good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that that's the truth, right? Yep. Because we, we shove down that feeling of being upset and angry mm -hmm. and hurt and sad. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, and we really want them to be able to express that and come through it with some solutions. Your feelings are appropriate. Your feelings are normal. Your feelings are your feelings. Right. How you act on your feelings is a whole other conversation. That's another conversation. That's right. Well, and I think to go back to resiliency, there yeah. was a study that, I, and I can't remember the, the source of the study, but they, they talked about resiliency for children who have been traumatized. And um, they named four things. And one was learning, to, learning the names and to be able to identify your emotions. So exactly what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. Knowing what to do with those emotions when you have them. Mm -hmm. Success at school. So whatever that success looks like. Oh, there are five things. Uh, a relationship with a caring adult. adult yep. And being good at something. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes in my treatment, I say to parents, okay, what are we going to find that this child is good at? Right. And even if it's something for a preschooler, like washing brushes, uh, washing paintbrushes, like we're going to make them the best paintbrush washer in all of Western Mass. <laughs> and we are going to praise them and praise them and praise them because they have to know that they're good at something. Yep. Exactly. And they don't have to be good at everything. And no. that's okay to no. let them know that too. No, it's just being good at something. Right. That Feel. brings up something for me that is a focus in, in our treatment at, at BHN now is, is solution-focused approaches is saying let's not always focus on the times that don't work because right. there's going to be times when it when it does. So if you're some if you're a child who has a fear of the dark and difficulty going to sleep and an anxiety around that, eventually you fall asleep. And there are nights when you successfully fall asleep. So let's focus on the nights. Let's not focus forever on the times when you're lying in bed awake scared and why and let's focus on when it does work, mm -hmm. what made that happen mm -hmm. and how can we replicate that again? Right. How can we make that happen more? You make a good point of referring back to the positives that mm -hmm. have happened in mm -hmm. the child's life and making them aware. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's hard to do. So when you're, when you're at the grocery store and your child 
passes by the candy without having a tantrum yep. and you're in a hurry and you're tired, you can, you can easily not say something right. to your child. But the way that they're going to learn is if you do say something yep. to them. Right, exactly. We always call it catch them being good. Right, catch so if there's good. something that was difficult, you always catch your kid being bad, but you want to catch them being successful. Yep. Catch them managing an emotion that was difficult six months ago or two months ago. Mm -hmm. Great job with that. You walk by the candy aisle and we kept on going. Nice work. What did you do? How did you make, how did you do that? Right. How did you decide to keep walking in that moment? And I know that you were sad. Yes. I, I know that you were sad. And going back to the movie, I think uh -huh. uh, just in kind of a wrap up, the movie brings out a lot of those simple emotions that are all complicated, but they all seem to work together, mm -hmm. right? They all work together. Joy is really trying to overpower everybody else. She's in control. Mm -hmm. She's at the keyboard. She's in control. But I think in the end, when she lets them have their emotion, when she lets sadness kind of mm -hmm. experience her sadness and share the knowledge, because mm -hmm. sadness was pretty smart. Mm -hmm. She had some pretty yep. great ideas. Yep. Um, so I think going back to that, remembering that every emotion is important in the development of our children mm -hmm. and ourselves. And you, to be patient. And to be patient. Mm -hmm. It's not easy, but it's good. Very yep. good. Any last comments? Uh, you know, I always also think, when does a parent seek help? And we talked a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. So seeking help, where would you start to seek help? Well, I think as Alice said earlier, is that it's coming back to that a little bit. It's when it's when you're having difficulty with an emotion or, yep. or a relationship, and it's interfering with your daily life. Right. So either your sleep, or your schooling, or your work, or whatever it is that is supposed to be your normal life, or your relationships, mm -hmm. and when you're really struggling with living life. That's when you as seek you help. want to seek and, help, and, and that's for kids and adults, and, and, <laughs> and, and you know, and and. Um, and that, that this range of emotions is, is completely normal. Right. And to have a bad day is completely normal. Right. Um, but it's when it's interrupting that development. That's exactly. Alexander and his terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Speaking yes. of books, right. yes. that happens. Right. It does. And that happens. And right. so um, Behavioral Health Network uh, is, a, is a resource in our community. Yes. Uh -huh. um, you would also start with maybe a guidance counselor. If the child is in elementary school, and this, sometimes the counselors in school, particularly if the emotions are manifesting there, yep. would be a great place to start. Mm -hmm. Your pediatrician yes. is a place to go, but in this community, Pathways for Parents Certainly, if is they a called our go. office, we could certainly provide them the resources mm -hmm. that they're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, but thank you. So thank it you. was a great conversation. Always lovely to talk with both of you. Thank you. Hopefully our parents uh, have questions, and they call us with those, and I will send them the resources. Our website will have also some information about the literature and the words and your contact. Thank you.